Tacky Talk time with State Representative Tacky Chan of Quincy. This will be actually the last uh, Tacky Talk of April 2023, Tacky. Yeah, it's uh, essentially our uh, third year anniversary at this point in April. So much, happy anniversary. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't get you a cake, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get you chocolates. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll send you some flowers. <laughs> so, uh, we've what's been going aging, on? Well, we're aging together, Joe. That's all I got to say. We're aging together. Exactly. And we and we're documenting it for all for all to see. <laughs> yeah, digital recordings. It's a lifetime with this stuff. That's right. So cool. When we're long gone, people look back and say, Oh, look at those two old guys. <laughs> Essentially, yes. This is a strange journal we've been keeping together. <laughs> um, but you know what? We're here and now, so this is the time we're in. So this is what we're doing. We are. And uh, today uh, is the day after the budget. So it's kind of the uh, budget hangover for the house <laughs> to see how it went. Oh, so, it seemed to go pretty smoothly this year, though. It went extremely smoothly this year. Uh, there's um, sufficient funds to get us through the cycle. Uh, big surprise, folks. If uh, people are able to get some of their uh, projects at home and some major policy issues done by funding, it tends to cause less problems. Not a big surprise, right? And the tax package that we did, we talked about uh, at length twice now, uh, that we did a few weeks back, uh, also uh, eliminated need to discuss tax revenue debate as part of the budget, whether it be uh, increasing or uh, seeking ca- tax cuts or deductions or credits. And uh, since we already addressed all that, that actually took out a big chunk of the first day's debate. First day's debate is often about uh, revenue issues and uh, trying to deal with uh, any type of uh, credit deductions. So that really sped things up, actually, taking that portion out. And yeah, you don't have to argue about what to spend money on because you have enough for everything. <laughs> that's essentially correct. I mean, we wouldn't push forward uh, a $1.1 billion uh, tax reduction initiative over the course of uh, three years uh, if there wasn't sufficient funds projected out. And uh, we can't predict the future. And historically, the House and the Senate actually is fairly conservative about the revenue generation numbers. Uh, we're very, very conservative, which is why people are always very surprised there's a little bit of surplus at the end of every year. Not a monster surplus. I mean, you got to remember the percentage and size of the budget, but I mean, we always create some buffers in space uh, in case <clears throat> revenues don't quite work out. <laughs> and, um, you know, we get our big numbers, um, obviously April, uh, we uh, get our numbers at the fiscal year end on, on you know, mid-July. We get our next big set of numbers uh, in October when the controller closes the books. And by October, it sets up the projection for the remaining fiscal year. As we've talked in the past, you know, Christmas uh, season, you know, January numbers are very important regarding uh, especially uh, sales tax. And uh, you also uh, finish off tax collection in October for the late filers. And uh, you get the estimated uh, halfway through estimated tax filings. And then you know, when we get to March, you know, you get to the, uh, you know, the, uh, the section, you know, of car sales and things like that in February, and it sets us up for uh, April. And most people do not like to let the government hold their money on the refunds longer than they have to. So the refund numbers come up pretty quick in March. And it, again, helps set up the projections, you know, for the following fiscal year by the time we get it. The Senate is always a little bit advantageous because the Senate will get one more month of uh, revenue projection numbers then we will be able, it's one of these kind of funky things where uh, in a month's time, the numbers could show better or worse and the Senate will respond accordingly. And then when it gets to the conference committee, they'll look at the June and uh, May, June numbers as we try to, to get the budget to the governor's desk by June 30th. So this has always been a bit of a moving target. I don't think people really appreciate the fact that you're not exactly working with um, actual cash in hand yet. And uh, we have to uh, create um, projections based on the past and looking forward to what economists think down to the future. So, you know, obviously, uh, the last three years are very unusual. I will never expect to see this again in my lifetime uh, on a number of different levels. Uh, but for economic purposes, it's been very, very unusual. And, uh, you know, we, you know, at some point, the other shoe's got to fall in the economy. And uh, we can't predict when. Uh, all I know is that... Uh, so this budget and definitely the next budget as well is kind of a brace for impact situation. Do I think it's going to be like 03, 08? No. Do I think that you should not be expecting you know, high levels of generosity from the Commonwealth? Probably yes. Um, I'm not thinking that we're going to have to cut 
to the bone. But I mean, I think there's going to be a paling back. And the rainy day fund, a stabilization fund, sitting at about $9 billion against the $55 billion budget, you know, is a pretty good buffer zone in case, you know, there's a downturn. Does the uh, House budget uh, differ all that much from the, the governor's proposal, Tacky? Um, yeah. I mean, we get new information after the governor's folks get their budget. So, for example, you know, uh, you know, we had the district attorney in Norfolk County looking for some funds uh, because his rent agreements came up uh, after the governor's budget was done. You can't, you know, try to cram a rent agreement down on your office space uh, around the governor's deadlines and budget filing. So, once he got his final numbers up, you know, we houses were revised the Norfolk County DA's numbers to reflect the, uh, the higher infrastructure cost. And uh, he's baked in four or five or so years, I think. You can ask Mike about that, but I mean, you know, about you know, five years uh, baked in budget. So he got himself a fixed rent with, I believe, no increase. So he, he did a great job with rent. But again, the, the house has to account for that. And like all state agencies, as they kind of readjust uh, their uh, budget numbers based on, I don't know, utilities, rent, <laughs> Things like Fixed that. Fixed costs, essentially, right? Yeah. Fixed costs. I mean, we, the House will will adjust the budget away from the governor as we get newer numbers. Uh, this includes health insurance, GIC, uh, as Group Insurance Commission. And, uh, you know, those numbers are being changed. Uh, I've been trying to deal with my own open enrollment now because this is the first substantive change in open enrollment for years, especially the Tufts Harvard Pilgrim merger. I'm a, Huff, I'm a Tufts, uh, I'm sorry, I'm a Harvard Pilgrim uh, utilizer. And we all know about the data breach. And it's total chaos over there uh, regarding processing claims and billing. Um, uh, I've already contacted the Office of Economic Affairs, which oversees the division insurance. I'm like, hey, guys, um, you probably should pay attention to this. This is going to get ugly. People aren't able to get uh, paid for their jobs on reimbursements by insurance companies. So hopefully this is resolved soon. Um, so, I mean, obviously, you know, everyone else is feeling it too you know, regarding the cost of um, health insurance, uh, that does trickle down to me, uh, like everybody else. And, you know, my share of health insurance uh, is going to go up, um, you know, as part of my salary, too. So, you know, again, the, the House will deviate from the governor. I expect the Senate to deviate from the House and the governor. Again, when they get more numbers, there's other uh, government agencies uh, reporting in about infrastructure cost changes. Of course, the biggest change this year, I guess, for the budget is the new revenue from the millionaires tax, right? Yeah, I've been really conservative. I expected the governor, uh, the governor, and uh, well, the governor already did. And there's no expecting. He she put the billion dollar cap on it. We did the same, and the uh, Senate should also follow suit. Uh, we're, we're putting uh, anything above a billion dollars in a separate trust fund. We really don't know how much is going to project out. The advertising you saw is old data, uh, very much pre-pandemic data from 2017, if I recall correctly, and it's now 2023. After three months of very strange, uh, three years, well, actually the last two months too, very yeah. crazy uh, upheaval of uh, of everyone's income, uh, especially those in uh, passive income and the home sales. So it's been a real fluctuating market, and I expect the fluctuations will continue for a while. Um, so we, we, you know, we put a hundred, uh, we put a billion dollars aside, with five hundred million dollars into transportation items, and five hundred million dollars in education. Uh, it does, the Constitution can't dictate exactly how we spend the money as long as it somehow falls in those two buckets. So, you know, we're able to address things like, you know, permanent school lunches, for example. Um, and the MBTA. <laughs> yeah, there's going to be more shuttle buses. I think uh, there's plenty of notifications, flyers, uh, uh, social media, emails. Uh, as they continue to do tie replacement in the red line, um, as they get closer to certain stations, you know, during the weekend, uh, it's actually just easier for them as they get closer and closer to a station area, just to shut the station down and rip up all the ties and just replace everything at once in 48 hours as quickly as they can. This, this is, again, it's, it's not as easy as sounds. You have to go in there, you know, inspect it, rip everything out. And the equipment is on, you know, human driven. I mean, it's people doing the work physically. The lifting, putting, placing, lining up, and using you know various machines to carry, and also do the the testing of the material, plus you know ensure it is properly aligned. Um, and some of the spots of the train rail doesn't have a lot of space next to it. Those who ride the train know that some parts are elevated, and that you do not have the ability to spread out, so to speak. 
So as you get closer to a, a train station, there's even less space to spread out. Is there money in the new budget? I'm assuming there is for the T. Yeah, we under the, under the millionaire's tax part of the half man, we put some money aside for the MBTA. The supplemental budget that the governor fought also includes some money for the bonuses, as we've talked about the hiring challenges. And uh, I think they had a um, hiring session back at the Walson Station last Saturday, I believe. Yep. So I expect to be more of those coming up. And again, I mean, you know, we, this is a pro labor market right now. You know, there's plenty of jobs out there at various uh, skill and income levels. Uh, it's very competitive for everyone trying to um, make this work. Uh, and uh, the T is no exception. And, uh, you know, it's again, changing workforce. The idea of a pension and a government job, younger folks don't, uh, aren't they interested? Uh, it, it's not, it's, it's just a different, it's just a different um, mentality. It is, yeah. And it's going to take, you know, generations for it to change over to the, the new reality, if you will. Agreed. Uh, you know, the, uh, you know when I, even when I was younger in government, you know, the idea of a pension wasn't a priority for me. But, you know, talk to a generation older than I am, uh, when young people got out, I mean, their priority was to secure a job that wasn't mm-hmm. going anywhere. Uh, even though it wasn't exactly a, a huge money-making job in terms of every year increases uh, or a massive spike in uh, salary change because of growing economy. Uh, you know, the idea of a pension and, and a guaranteed steady gig is a big deal. T- today, it's not. Uh, you know, survey of millennials, you know, qual- uh, identifies quality of life at the workplace as a priority. Now, yeah. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, going out in the middle of the night, carrying large steel and uh, concrete railers, railings uh, to work rapidly and uh, using hammers and large machinery. Uh, and if you're looking for high quality of life, uh, like you're living at home, doing your job, uh, social media for money, uh, there's a huge disparity. Exactly. It's, uh, it takes a special person to do that kind of work for sure. And uh, there's few and far between and you need, you need to pay for them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, everyone's paying prima dollars as much as they can for any kind of workers, but Again, it's a different quality of life issue. I mean, pandemic has changed, especially especially among millennials. You know, they, they see quality of life as being a priority, meaning they'd like to dictate the terms of the workplace. Mm. And uh, that, that doesn't how life works, folks. And, you know, it, Anything in the budget specific to Quincy you can talk about, Jackie? Sure. I mean, we got some uh, money again for the budget. I mean, uh, we got some overtime patrols again uh, from state police along DCR properties, including... Uh, Quinshaw Drive and French Road Parkway. Uh, Bruce Ayers worked very hard advocating for that money. And he also, Bruce did a great job. He got some uh, money for the uh, Rusciutti Drive. I know that's a big problem for all our constituents uh, regarding a, tra- a temporary traffic light system, meaning that the uh, traffic lights are mobile uh, and it's not like a permanent structure. And uh, working with uh, Ali over at the uh, city traffic department, which everybody has high praise for, as well as in the state, and we, they're hoping they can come up with some uh, solutions regarding the trap, but a traffic pattern through a lighting system over there sure to drive. It's going to take some months to sort out, but you know, if the, if the money holds through the budget, you know, that'd be very helpful. Uh, you know, now with the matching Bob Hale and donating to the presidential library, uh, another half million dollars, another half million dollars from the state is going to go into that project for a total of one million dollars over the course of two years. Again, it's a huge priority uh, for the mayor and delegation's very happy we could support that. Um, we got a few dollars for QCAP uh, to do some more homeless assistance. Again, you know, the economy shifting and we'll see how the second half of this year works. Uh, you know, I got some of my own projects done obviously as well. Uh, Germantown Aywood Center, uh, Coons Asian Resources are both important agents to me and service agencies for the, co- uh, for the um, city. Uh, in the case of actually Coons Asian Resources, it is for the Commonwealth. They've actually been branching out to a lot of places and done interviews with with Philip and those guys, um, you know, we got a few dollars for uh, the hazmat again for the Quincy fire. Uh, as we all know, the, the Fort River fire, a big part of it is the hazmat uh, component that is, um, uh, you know, essential equipment and training for that stuff. And, you know, it's, it's uh, well invested money. Um, you know, I'm going to cheat now uh, and, and switch over to my, to my, uh, <clears throat> to my phone here to look at stuff. Um, how are the things we were able to get done? You know, two hundred thousand dollars for Quincy College to help support those students. We got some money for Friends of Faxon Park, a big important project for the speaker. Um, 
in particular. Uh, we got a little bit of money for an organization of Chinese Americans. They've been working very hard regarding the Asian hate issues and impacting children, especially teenagers, and the challenges of uh, bullying and things like that. Um, so, uh, you know, we did a well overall. Oh, Beaches Commission, right? Uh, I'm still on the Beaches Commission, Metropolitan Beaches Commission. About $900,000 spent throughout the, the area of all the metropolitan beaches uh, owned by the DCR. And, uh, you know, there's some money there also for the Forward Basin uh, regarding uh, DEP issues. It's not um, exactly a Quincy issue in the sense that it's really both sides. River that was carried forth by the delegation you know, on the William of Quint the Braintree side to carry that water uh, for, on that project. So I think you guys get the picture that we don't all jump on one thing together. All of us uh, work on a different project around the city, uh, as well as the geographic region has mutual interest. Uh, so not one person carries all the weight, so to speak. Sure. And um, speaking of water issues, any dredging money for Quincy Bay? Working on it. There's a million, about a million two ish, I think, in cash that hopefully the city's keeping its waterway trust fund that we got over the past legislative cycle. It better be in that waterways trust fund. <laughs> Otherwise, we're going to have some problems. Uh, it's about a $7 million project, give or take. Wow. It's like six or seven. It's The price tag shifts around. Dredging ain't cheap. Hmm. So I still got some bond money out there. I'm still waiting to get my appointment with the governor. Um, and starting to make the ask and see if she'll uh, release the bond money, even if it's in part over the multiple years. Uh, same thing with the C Street safety project. I got bond money. And with a Democratic governor, you know, it's a, it's a good time to advocate for that. Uh, you know what the timing is good. I think I'm in good stead with the administration, but again, I'm still waiting for my appointment. I understand that she has a lot of things going on. Um. Is online lottery part of the budget, Techie? Came out of the House Ways and Means version. It was not touched going through the budget process. Head over to the Senate. The Senate uh, did not do this last time when we put in an economic development bill. I do not expect the Senate to put it in as part of the budget. The Senate policy at the Senate President's office is that uh, whatever we do, they don't. So, and whatever <laughs> they do, we don't. So whatever's in the house, the Senate won't do. There's a reason they think- Oh, that's is- democracy at its finest. <laughs> this was not the way when I started this gig. They only oh. disagreed on major policy issues. All the routine stuff uh, shouldn't be a problem. So for example, I was able to put into budget uh, charitable, uh, uh, charitable alcohol auctions. This was expired in 2018, sunset law. Uh, and it really, really just applies really big, really big uh, entities are uh, getting donations and large- Variable qualities of alcohol for auctioning for charities. And, uh, you know, expired in 2018. And we never thought about it again because the pandemic showed up in 2020 because we're doing like an revaluation, but whether it makes sense. And ABCC called over and they're like, hey, um, we're getting these requests this summertime for these big events in Martha's Vineyard. I'm like, oh. <laughs> so normally I try to move this through the legislative process of passing a bill out, but given the urgency of the matter, August is coming quickly, and the budget seemed the most prudent way to get it done because it has to be done by July. And even if it's not uh, passing law in both House and Senate are in agreement, I mean, the NBCC can move forward with the assurance that the governor is going to sign into law. So, you know, right now we're uh, dealing with a time crunch situation and the budget uh, is a vehicle to address a time crunch policies, uh, uh, something like this. So, you know, we're working, uh, you know, on uh, these kind of things that are beyond the city of Quincy, uh, but, you know, it has huge implications statewide. People sometimes forget I do other stuff beyond just local projects. I do um, I have, a, have a bit of responsibility on the, on the bigger scale. Uh, through not just committee chair, but also uh, through other organizations I work with statewide. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, it passed unanimously. So there you go. Yeah. I mean, like I said, most of the, uh, pretty much almost all the uh, consolidated amendments, they take all our amendments and put them into a monster amendment as we kind of like try to get stuff in and out of consolidated after we see the thing. Um, And it was, like I said, it was a really quiet um, debate. Again, once we got the revenue stuff out of the way, um, both uh, end of the political spectrum, really the far end of the spectrum tends to pick mm-hmm. it up in their battles. And, and that that was not the battleground this year. Um, you know, a lot of the projects that people were looking for didn't get everything you want. No one ever gets anything you want. 
Right. But you know, they reached a satisfaction level that mission accomplished. They, they got what they needed to get things done. So various state agencies and private organizations, the state supports, as well as our own local projects. And you know, I like to say, you know, everyone got a piece of cake out of it. So, you know, I have no complaints. I mean, <clears throat> putting aside, you know, the, you know, I have a large number of policy stuff this year. You know, I, I filed 15 amendments. I got um, 12. Pretty good, pretty good odds. <laughs> Yeah, remarkably good. I, I yeah. rarely get 12. I mean, generally I get a close to the 50% or a little bit lower uh, rate on amendment success, regardless of how many amendments I file. So, you know, this is closer to to uh, 75% success rate. So yeah. I honestly can't complain. <laughs> you know, I really can't. Now that's news in itself. The tacky's not complaining. <laughs> well, no one ever listens, even though I just hit the mute button if I start complaining. It's not like you can't turn me off. <laughs> uh, so let's uh, switch gears and talk about the Supreme Court throwing out like 30,000 <laughs> drunk driving cases. Oh, uh, the, uh, so it's, yeah, I, I know we always talk about activist courts all the time, but people tend to context that in the federal level. People don't realize the Supreme Judicial Court is, a, is uh, extremely engaged in making their own laws, let's put it that way. I mean, I have an opinion that every judge is an activist judge because every judge comes in with their own personal biases and points of view of the world but that applies to how they issue case law. And uh, I don't care who you are. You're human as everybody else. You're not a machine. Although the way uh, AI is going, maybe we all get replaced. That's uh, true. But, you know, uh, but uh, but it gets AI is garbage in, garbage out. You know, I always it's remember too. Yeah. So uh, you know, the Supreme Judicial Court, you know, they they decided the evidence wasn't probably done, and here we go again. And very similar to the, the any Duke and drug case situation, you know, what is the uh, proper due process, and one or two or three human beings uh, deciding that they should be judge and jury. Yeah, I mean, and and the unspoken part of this is the is the victims um, uh, of these incidents are going to have to you know relive them again. Uh, that is a big problem, and you know the court. Well, I understand the point of due process, and I value due process very much as well. You know, the, the rem- the, they're not great at providing remedies. So a court can provide ruling on the underlying law, but they also can provide a remedy, and generally, the legislature's trying to interpret. Is there remedy in their case law or not? And whether or not, you know, we're able to thread the needle on it. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes. I mean, district yeah. attorneys have to work out for them. And also the defense attorneys, you know, also have a lot of work out of them. And you write about the victims. And you also, you also got insurance claims, you know, somewhat out there because of the nature of these cases. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's a lot to go through. And it's, you know, it's very regretful. And, It'd be a little bit, again, it'd be easier if the courts actually said, hey, okay, well, we got a problem in due process, you know, here's a remedy. Yeah, that didn't happen, unfortunately. Um, I'd be curious to see if the governor, you know, looks uh, to kind of reshuffle things like she did at the MBTA. We'll see. Um, I mean, the, there's a mandatory retirement age in Massachusetts judges. It's age 70. So every judge in Massachusetts, it's age 70, you're done, you're out. So... Charlie Baker had, uh, you know, a very strong hand on appointing judges, like a lot of judges, including more than half of the Supreme Judicial Court. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but they're also aging out. And uh, if Maura Healy uh, serves two full terms, which she may not, she may, I have no idea. Um, I'm a term by term based kind of guy too, and what I'm going to do in my life. Um, you know, she could potentially uh, fill the court again with uh, perhaps uh, not quite half, but maybe three out of seven. So, um, you know, timing's everything on some of this stuff. And, uh, you know, obviously, you know, the legislation court doesn't always get along. Uh, well, it's designed that way <laughs> in the Constitution. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We won't get into some of the cases to, regarding in my lifetime. I was like, what are you doing? Um, but, you know, we've worked out a work around it as well. And, uh, but I mean, there's no interest by the legislature to change the court system. We're one of five states, I believe, that has an appointed system, mm-hmm. uh, not elected judges. Most states have elected judges. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And some judges aren't actually court judges. They're basically administrative judges. Some of our are court judges, and some actually do elect their, US, I'm sorry, elect their Supreme Courts. Like there was a huge case in Wisconsin. Yeah. There was a massive battle uh, between, it was a partisan race. It's not a nonpartisan race. It's D's and R's. 
uh, fighting over an election of a judge. And uh, most people in Massachusetts doesn't live with this kind of campaigning, so you're not used to it. But if you go uh, pretty much, you know, 45 some odd states and uh, some are elected statewide, they're elected at the county level. So, you know, county politics is very different in other states. And, uh, you know, it's, it's it, and there's also specific rules of ethics around judge fundraisers. Uh, they have to do special committees that is segregated from the judge. It's, it's quite involved. Right. Yeah. We have the governor's council here in Massachusetts. So that's where voters can have their say. Yeah. People know what they were voting for governor's council because as we, as I, most of the people listening have no idea what we're talking about. This You're right. Percentage. Small percentage that actually know what I'm saying are very astute in Massachusetts civics. The the rest of you are like, what well, is a governor's council, right? And uh, it's actually our, a very important role. Yeah, it is. They uh, appoint, uh, they approve judge uh, recommendations by the governor. Uh, they approve notaries and justice of peace, and they have uh, powers regarding uh, commute, com- uh, commuting sentences. So people forget the final. You have to have to go to the council commuting a sentence. But constitution, lieutenant governor is. Uh, the chair of the governor's council is eight members elected and lieutenant governor is the chair the lieutenant governor is unavailable the governor can chair the governor can't chair the acting governor can chair which would be secretary galvin uh, if both the governor and lieutenant governor are not available but it's that's the pecking order lieutenant governor governor didn't move down a constitutional officer line of the unavailability un- because they're out of state or incapacitated right yeah and unfortunately usually it's the place on the ballot that people just vote for the candidate for re-election or leave it blank <laughs> Uh, yeah, and even when they're challenged, trying to understand their role and their uh, v- uh, their so-called voting record or their uh, achievements is is kind of a tricky wicket because you got to really have to understand, like really understand every single appointment day, who they appointed, what that appointment's about. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of appointments here. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, you vote- have to really research it and be dedicated to looking into it, you know, uh, because it's it's not provided for you. You need to go looking for it. And it's a super important job. It's, it's not like me. Believe it or not, looking at my record ain't that hard. Right. It, it really isn't. Um, which means the news media, uh, the availability of the internet, just Googling stuff, as well as, um, you know, going to the state's website or even just mm-hmm. going to the city, uh, going to, I'm sorry, the town, uh, the Senate and House clerk's offices. Mm-hmm. Plus, you can go, if you want paper, you know, you can go to the uh, State House Library and pull the journals out. And, you know, there's always Westlaw. For those old attorneys, I mean, you know, if you buy the one that includes legend of histories, you can kind of, you know, decipher what's happening uh, if you know how to read it, particularly the attorneys, you know, obviously Westlaw is an attorney usage or paralegal usage as well. So, you know, they know how to decipher what's going on when they read the Westlaw. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not a little storage resources. Governor's Council is much more complex because yeah. you know, it's actually not just they're devoted to council, but who they voted for. See, I'm a public policy, right? Money, public policy, you like the policy, not like the policy, you get it. They vote on humans <laughs> to be judges. <clears throat> so if you're a voter who's concerned about your governor's council, you actually have to look at the judges they appointed. Right, exactly, yeah. Um, but that's the process here in Massachusetts, at least. So that's that's the way, uh, that's the system we have right now. <laughs> yeah, and also uh, uh, shields the... You know, shields the legislature from actually being engaged in the process, right? I mean, yeah. obviously, there's campaign money involved, but you can't donate. I know if you're a nominee, you have to like have a one year grace period, I believe, if you're a nominee, you know, gov- giving to the governor's council. But then once you're a judge, you and your family members cannot raise money for anyone. So uh, there are a lot of prohibit- prohibitions on, on judicial members. Uh, once they, you know, appointed and including going to the nomination process, the governor's council is separate from the legislature. We don't appoint them. We don't affect them. They're constitutionally created, so we can't actually get rid of them um, through a well, constitutional amendment, which is we talked in the past is not an easy thing to do. Right. Um, so it, it is really a, a, a body is actually um, the word isn't shielded, but definitely uh, not as influenced by the legislature. Yeah, but, and, and rightfully so. You know, I mean. <laughs> We're seeing the uh, U.S. Supreme Court having issues with that right now, at least one member. Well, I mean, I wish we could take judges to private, uh, I'm sorry, take uh, flights to, to private islands and get lovely gifts of Frederick Douglass original first editions. I just saying, um, 
I do understand that every state's ethics laws are different. I'm, I'm aware that D.C. is different from every creature. And I know that Massachusetts is one of the strictest ethics laws in the country, including keeping finance. I don't care what the sunshine people say. If you actually do look around and see how things work in other states, when I talk to other people in other states, how things work, I'm always aghast because I'm like, we couldn't get away with it here. Uh, but the U.S. Supreme Court in particular is, is really kind of like, really? And, uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter your political persuasion or your personal opinions. Uh, they all pl- put their hand in the pot and they've been doing it forever. Uh, and it doesn't matter uh, if you think one judge is your righteous cause judge. They're no different from anyone else. Mm-hmm. So this is, a, you know, Chief Justice uh uh, Roberts, you know, oversees the administration of the court. Um, they're going to have to come up with some solutions regarding, you know, what they're going to do here because the um, questionable integrity of the system is uh, is problematic. Uh, polling has showed that the public in general has the lowest faith in the U.S. Supreme Court ever since they started polling. And faith in our judicial system is one of the uh, pillars of foundation in American society. And apparently certain justices, uh, well, they all participate in this uh, behavior. Uh, some of these are worse than others mm-hmm. uh, on the surface. And uh, apparently being a pillar of American society is not relevant to them, which is actually a very sad state about responsibility and understanding the bigger picture of where you are in it all, and particularly a group that's that elite. Uh, there, there's barely, um, what, barely under 200 maybe, not even 200. U.S. Supreme Justices in the history of the country. Right. So, yeah. And I'm curious, um, I would ex- not expect it from somebody of their generation, uh, you know, not not to malign younger generations, but it, it just the way that they were brought up at, at, during the time in this country when they were brought up, I think morals and ethics were different. It's amazing how power corrupts can get corrupts absolutely, right? I mean, particularly when you have zero oversight. Uh, you know, John Adams correctly pointed out the court needed to be an independent structure of the three branches of the government so they can be impartial in decision making and not be influenced by politics. Of course, John Adams created a political mechanism to get him appointed through the U.S. Senate. So it creates some degree of accountability to the states because, again, it's U.S. senators weren't elected at the time. They were state appointed positions to the U.S. Senate to ensure the state rights are considered as part of appointment of judges at the time. And also to pick quality people over six year terms that aren't subject to the whims of the mob. You know, is, is, <laughs> yeah. what did Adams say? You know, the uh, is it was it regarding a mob uh, rule is the most dangerous thing or something like that? Yes, but, yes. Um, yeah. And if yeah, it's it's an extreme statement, but if you think about it carefully, you you understand what he's getting at. I mean, the, the yeah. public being sways move the wind and impacts uh, us who in two year terms. You know, regarding re-election, the, the shifting patterns of, of people's uh, opinions move easily. And John Adams was very astute about the fact that people can, as a group, especially in a group, can change their minds in a, in a heartbeat. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, I give the guy credit; he gets that. Uh, and we live it; we live with it. The most people don't understand. Uh, but the, um, uh, you know, the, that was the thought process of how you said appoint them. Uh, and uh, but you know, I didn't think they would ever uh, envision. Um, you know, the kind of things that are going on now. Uh, and of course, don't forget, we've changed the court size more than once. It's not It's not always been uh, nine. It was uh, once seven, but the first one, I believe, was six. I think that's right, yeah, which just boggles the mind because how do you break a tie? Yeah, John Marshall, the first Supreme Court justice, had to do with the ability to have a deadlock court. And mm-hmm. uh, you know, Congress has the ability to grow and shrink the size of the court. The Constitution mm-hmm. is silent regarding the number of members. So, uh, you know, court has changed over the years. Uh, but yeah, you're right, six. Like Congress made it six. It was like, what were you all thinking down there? <laughs> People always uh, assume it was five to seven, but no, it was six. <laughs> right, yeah, I know. Can we, um, can I ask you about a local issue, Tacky? Um, no, I know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Regarding the Lunar uh, New Year, and do you think it should be a school holiday here in Quincy? Yeah, I saw that in the paper. I saw, I'm sorry, the, the Sun. I, I, uh, I get the digital version of the legend. I still get the paper version of the Sun. And I saw it in the front page the first time. There were like five or six people testifying in favor of that proposal. So a little bit of education, folks. So the lunar holiday, not for everyone, for most folks, this is considered a secular holiday. 
a lot of the recognitions of holidays uh, in the city are generally revolved around Gregorian calendars or religious. And, you know, I use uh, Russia. I think I pronounced this correctly. Russia, Russia, Shana, Hana. Oh, God. Close. Russia, Shana. Russia, Shana, you know, is the Jewish New Year. Yep. We, probably, we probably should do something for Ramadan, for example. It's a mm-hmm. holy uh, week, uh, weekend for, oh, is it two days? It's like a sundown to sun up kind of thing, too. I think that's right, yeah. So it's like two days in a weird kind of sundown, sun up situation, you know, for the Muslim community, right? Um, in the Buddhist community, depending which any lunar candle you use, you know, the life, death, and um, uh, ascendance of the Buddha you know, happen on the same day on the calendar and is a recognized uh, by the United Nations. Uh, that's a religious holiday. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what the First Amendment, uh, you know, keeps church and state separate. It isn't that we haven't, we also, we're, uh, we also can, you know, respect other people's religions. Um, you can do it through the school system, you know, whether or not, you know, giving, you know, kids a, a day off or, um, you know, create a holiday for that day. Uh, lunar lunar uh, New Year is actually kind of an interesting conversation because it's not it, it uh, not for everyone, but for many folks, it is not a religious holiday. No, it's it's like New Year's Day here, right? Yeah, the Gregorian calendar on New Year's Day is not a religious thing. It's you had to have a start and end of a calendar. Right. Let's be right. honest about this. It's it's not. It's a little bit of an arbitrary situation from the Gregorian calendar about when things begin and when things end. And uh, the lunar calendar, uh, well, it was based on a, a wonderful story, um, which we probably have heard a few times already you know, through uh, QATV and other sources. Um, you know, it does involve a jade emperor, you know, a, a type of a godlike figure, but, you know, it's not a worshipped holiday. And this is kind of an interesting Debate. We'll see if the school committee can get their heads around. Yeah, I, I know the vice chair supports the, the holiday, although he pointed out that you'd have to make the day up somewhere else in the year. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, to my knowledge, there are very few places that allow uh, students not to come in on lunar holiday. Um, and it, I believe it's uh, Boston Latin being one of them. Um, the only Boston Latin in the Boston school system. And uh, it is a major holiday for people that follow the lunar calendar. Uh, it actually goes on for two weeks. Uh, there is a Lantern Festival at the end. And uh, in China uh, and other places that follow the lunar calendar, they actually do a two-week holiday. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big party. <laughs> it's a big party. Uh, yeah. On the flip side, you don't have a whole lot of other holidays. True. Um, so uh, this is a, a traditional thing. I'm, I'm not obviously advocating for a two-week holiday. I'm just pointing out there's a bit of a difference here, right? Between religious holidays a virtue is a, a secular cultural holiday. Yes, although, I mean, New Year's Day is not religious, you know, either. It's a secular holiday, right? Yeah, but Christmas was before that. So, yeah. uh, you know, as people know, I work on my ho- on holidays, I work on my birthday. I don't care. But I do know it's important for many folks uh, that yeah. aren't workaholics. Um, you know, it's those days off to be with your family. At the same right, time, that was the big. I mean, in China at least, because it's so geographically huge, they needed that amount of time, right, to to go visit their families. Oh, it take you two weeks. I mean, the traffic jams in China can go on for like five days, depending right. where you are in the country, trying to get from point A to point B. And the train system, people travel a train a lot down there. It's it's because of just sheer number of people you got to move around. You can't put them all on a plane. Big right. country, very big country people. So uh, you know, you need the food two weeks to travel around the country. Yeah, uh, people here, you know, may. Uh, travel to a place like Canada, a lot of uh, Chinese folks in Canada, you know, may travel to other parts of the country and some will travel overseas, but not often uh, back to uh, you know, wherever uh, their country or actually town or city of origin where actually where their other family live. But it's also very pricey. You mm. know, to travel. And uh, you guys shouldn't be surprised, but you know, during the lunar holiday season, uh, airfare goes up like 400%. <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's, like, it's like spring break week, right? <laughs> yeah, like very specific destinations in Asian countries uh, will have a massive spike in airfare. A big surprise, right? So, um, you know, as you can tell, I'm kind of dodging the question a little bit because, you know, I didn't grow up in an environment where, you know, people took in consideration my feelings regarding uh, lunar holidays and whatnot. Uh, but 
Uh, you know, I was also was brought up in a different kind of mentality. Uh, yeah, we can always celebrate, but it doesn't have to be that day. And, you know, both my parents worked as well. And Christmas wasn't quite Christmas Day. And Lunar Day wasn't quite Lunar Day either. Uh, we ended up going on weekends uh, because it was a work day for my parents. And uh, it was a school day for me. And then, you know, dad would drag us out in the car on a Saturday, uh, you know, before, well, generally after the Lunar New Year Day is over. And uh, we go visit relatives and um which there aren't that many of actually you have to go um to canada to visit relatives but at the time uh but we visit a lot of old friends and i would collect my red envelopes and eat some candy and fruit and uh you know we we uh, pay our respects to our elders by driving mm-hmm. around visiting them mm-hmm. that was when i was a child my dad would drag drag your drag you out of bed we got to do this it's like 6 a.m on a saturday i want my saturday morning cartoons but no as we're getting, you know, doing our um, respects to to our elders, uh, driving around to our friends' houses. So, uh, but then again, we didn't do a lunar day. It was a work day for our, for mom and dad. Yeah, um, maybe you can't answer this. Does it, would it require state approval from the state department of education? If it's a makeup day, no. Oh, okay. Okay. I mean, you know, the, if you're as long as they meet the requirement of minimum number of days. No, it was like you know. Uh, you know, individual person for this and that regarding, you know, like um, special exemptions. I don't have any. I, I don't have an answer for you. Have to ask the school system. For example, if you want to take Ramadan off as a religious holiday period, what what do you do, right? Uh, and uh, I I don't have an answer. Um, okay. Also, uh, you know, it's an interesting question as well because, for example, you have holiday observed, so it falls on a weekend and not a business day. Ah. They observed, right? Good point. And, yep. Uh, the calendar doesn't always work to your favor, especially a lunar calendar was always a moving target right. because it's a sync with the Gregorian calendar. Yeah. And the Gregorian calendar's uh, one religious holiday really is uh, uh, is um, Christmas. Christmas, right. Yeah. And I do know that, you know, people can get Holy Friday off. And uh, when I was yes. saying, I got Holy Thursday and Holy Monday off and All Saints Day. <laughs> I do know these holidays because I got them off at, at St. Anne's. I didn't get them off at BC High. So. <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay. <laughs> yeah, very different educational approach at BC High. You're going to school, kids, period. Uh, and uh, we're here to whip an education into you. So <laughs> don't expect to, to enjoy the uh, extra holidays you got when you're in elementary school because of religious yeah. holidays. Okay. Like, but it's yeah, right? a very local decision then. Yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, when I was a brand, I was obviously different education institution. I had the Jewish holidays, right? But particularly sure. the two yeah. ones we talked about, your Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah and uh, Yom Kippur. Those were the two big ones. And yeah. I remember my Jewish friends were like, we should get uh, we should get Hanukkah. Off. And the school's like, no. Because <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they didn't want all eight days off. <laughs> yeah, you're not getting Hanukkah. I mean, it was the school system. The universe was very clear. No, you're not getting Hanukkah. Because Hanukkah fell right in the middle of uh, uh, midterm and final exams, depending on which classes you're in. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I was like, we can escape exams. Like, no. So, uh, <laughs> so okay, interesting. It'll be interesting to see uh, where it goes. Uh, you know, that correctly noted, um, the school committee vice chair indicated that, you know, at least 30% of the city's population is of some Asian descent. So but not, all of, population. but not all of us follow the exact same uh, practices. Right, right. The, you can't lump us into a group and say that. My parents would bristle at the idea of not oh. going to school. Oh, really? I, I, know, I know this for an answer. My dad, my dad was still around. Who just fly out and say, no, okay. you go to school. And, and people forget, I went to St. Anne's. St. Anne's didn't follow the pub, uh, Quincy Public School uh, school notices for snow days. Mm-hmm. You, actually, you have to actually listen for the Catholics who specifically on WBC radio at mm-hmm. 6.45 in the morning. To see if there's a cancellation, you have to stay on that radio to 7.30 to ensure that if school has been canceled. I've been to school when public, Quincy Public Schools were canceled. Mm-hmm. So, and the same thing with BC High. Just because Boston Public Schools closed doesn't mean that BC High closed. Yeah, most private schools are, I know, Severian Brothers is the same uh, as well. It's separate from the Braintree school system. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, I kind of grew up in a different kind of school system, and it's not a bad or good. I'm just pointing out the fact that, you know, uh, you know the old story of you know, traveling through snowstorms, uphill sideways, no shoes on kind of stories, right? But, uh, you know, it was different. Um, and of so course, that's another in- interesting point, though. So if if it is made a holiday in Quincy schools, and then 
a student decides or the parents tell them, you know, you yo, you can't have that day off. Do they get an extra day somewhere else? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, uh, particularly immigrant families uh, have a high value education yeah, as uh, moving forward. And the expectation is kids are going to succeed. The, the, the personal concerns do not uh, outweigh the interests of the child's education. Just saying. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you, my dad would be like, no. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> I'm a different generation, folks. Yeah, yeah. I'm a different generation. So okay. uh, we'll see how they how to respond and whether or not uh, the school committee actually has full grasp and knowledge about the diversity and different cultures associated with it and the uh, uh, differences between the religious and secular holidays. It'll be, it'll be a learning experience, quite appropriate in the school system, right? <laughs> oh, this was, again, the, uh, the challenges of uh, greater diversity in our government, right? If you have uh, more diversity in government, uh, particularly people who uh, live in um, different cultures, uh, able to provide better insight and understand that not even in China, there's so such a big country, you said earlier, they have different cultural differences among themselves and understand mm-hmm. the great diversity there. You know, uh, hopefully that helps you make more sound decisions you know, on a policy level. I do it at a statewide policy level. People don't realize this. I mean, you know, we do things... Um, you know, regarding boards and commissions, I mean, linguistic access, you know, sensitivity of things like human trafficking and domestic violence, you know, it's part of our conversations a lot and how it differs from other folks and how intimidation works and how coercion works. Um, you know, we, we do this on a statewide policy level, you know, have to understand the cultures we have to deal with and try to see if we can find public policies to meet those cultural differences to ensure that people are safe and people are uh, not protected under the civil rights. So, yeah, we do this at our level, and I don't uh, claim to have a knowledge of every single culture, but I mean, colleagues, you know, are from different parts of the state, and we have a mm-hmm. diverse conversation about this, and if they don't know, they'll uh, you know, find somebody that knows, mm-hmm. and as a part of it, give a simple example, I mean, one of the things we brought up to the Asian caucus for discussion about endorsement was creating a Muslim commission, mm-hmm. and uh, right off the bat, I'm like, uh, we have a church and state problem because this is not an issue got an ethnic group. Uh, this is a religious thing. And the reason I say that because, you know, different religions, you know, have different uh, um, entry points. Let's put it that way. Uh, and uh, race is not an entry point for most religions that I'm aware of, unless there is an entry point, race being an entry point for a religion or ethnicity being an entry point for religion. You, you have to, um, you know, go with the religion. So last time I checked, you know, everybody, every religion has a different um, requirements for entry, uh, for serious entry, not just say you are, like, you're going to do this. Right. Um, and uh, ethnicity uh, may or may not be relevant in circumstances. So, for example, you know, um, certain Native Americans, you know, have a, a ancestry based on maternal determination. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, you know, if I correctly remember, you know, Jewish, uh, Jewish is also maternal. Yes, uh, uh, but, you know, if you can become Jewish without a yes. maternal bloodline, but you have to go through a whole educational process. Right. Uh, and uh, I don't remember just saying that you have to be a certain ethnic group to get in. Right. No, you just have to fulfill the requirements uh, dictated by that religion. Yeah. Yeah. So this is where you run into a problem with the Muslim commission, uh, commission because it's not a, it becomes a church and state question. Yeah. So give an example of some of the conversations I have in my world. Uh, there's one of them as we're trying to get our heads around different things. And, uh, you know, I understand why uh, they want to have a state commission to help uh, guide uh, Muslims as well as help uh, provide advice on state government policy. However, we have the church and, church and state problem. And, uh, you know, how do you uh, change uh, the legislation um, to uh, better... Uh, reflect um, uh, the constitution regarding separation of church and state. And that, right. that conversation has already started, but you know, it's something I flagged in, it was sort of my colleague, Trump Wynn, who's also attorney flagged in caucus and uh, the sponsor of the bill just kind of was like, okay, okay, I guess see where you're coming from. But, you know, it did dawn it was going to be a problem uh, for reasons I don't quite grasp. And, um, and uh, you know, we do things for our constituents. But also remind folks, you have to think about this before you do things for your constituents. You just don't do it because they ask. You have to give it some thought mm-hmm. um, as you do things for your constituency. 
And uh, there's different politicians and some just say yes to everything. And I like to give it a little bit of thought before I say yes. That's all. We will have to leave it there because we're out of time, Zachy. Well, I uh, could see you, Joe. Uh, uh, happy anniversary again. And uh, hope you didn't mind my extended lessons on more random stuff we'd like to talk about. You brought up the <laughs> topic this time. I'm, I, I'm not taking the blame for this one. That's, I, I fully accept that. <laughs> last last oh, few times I meandered off the, the pathway to, to random things. So you can blame me for the ones no, I No, mean. not you. <laughs> I meandering. Uh, so, uh, well, you can tell I'm still a bit tired from the budget. <laughs> right, right. Um, let's uh, let's give out your contact information. Sure, 617-722-2370, uh, 617-722-2370 is the number. We're in room 42 in, in uh, the state house. Still, we are open. I am staffed. Uh, and staff is running around like old times. So sometimes not everyone's going to be at the phone as they're running from meeting to meeting. So we're returning to normal. And the tacky.chan at mahouse.gov, G-O-V, T-A-C-K-E-Y dot C-H-A-N at mahouse.gov. Ah, it's nice when the budget's over because I don't get as many emails about the budget right now. And of course, State Representative Facebook account, uh, State Representative Tacky Chan Facebook and at Tacky Chan at Twitter. Again, please don't social media messages. Just, just call the office. It makes my life a whole lot easier uh, to understand what's going on. And uh, Tacky Chan at ORG as well as um, the state website at mayorlegislature.gov. A reminder to folks that there is no longer uh, Facebook streaming regarding uh, public hearings that I chair. If you're interested in see what I do, um, the uh, state website is uh, required to uh, broadcast those and keep recordings now. And uh, partic- uh, if you want to participate at the state house on a virtual public hearing, like you want to testify, it's on Microsoft Teams. So be sure you have the right software downloaded on your device uh, so you can participate in public hearings as a testifier, uh, not with just my committee, but any committee. So just remind, remind folks that it's it's teams now. So, and of course, QA TV and uh, listen to Joe in the morning uh, on your podcast, uh, Quincy and Brief.